Good yeah, to go. We're using fuel. All right. Okay, may I start then? Yep, you can okay. start. Well, that's an interesting book for me because I have an idea on the bottom or really a deep uh, research in the form of book that I'm going to step by step. And you see in Cuba by a level of Can you see the, the second one slide? Yep. Okay. You're well, good to go. Uh, uh, our Alejo Carpentier and Balmo, as we can read a few mythology, but as, uh, by the way, he has an historian uh, background, so it's on the battle. Uh, it's a use of knowledge. Um, this is songs on your songs of the most important world. Echo Yan Bao, who has a big beginning, that's right. The kingdom of the world that we analyze in another class is the world as well. And the music in Cuba in 1946, the lot of theater. And by the way, there are some uh, films uh, about this book, for example, The Age of Enlightenment. I recommend a lot of those books, those films, because they are so, so clear. Uh, they reach uh, to project the idea that they out of the uh, developing book. Then this is our song on the influence in Carpentier. It's uh, we want to pay attention to the uh, surrealist movement in the 1930s while still was living in France, mainly in second cells style because that is something that he will project in another of the book, in another of the TV chair as a point of view. And, um, it's a so tight to something that we're going to present now. So then other person who deploys on him, Pablo Neruda, Miguel Angel Asturias, who did continue a French later, Pablo Picasso, Marie Francois, Francois, uh, Amadeo Roland, who will be needed in this book. Uh, those are different art forms that we're working on. Music, the radio, film, writing, and well. The concept of the real maravilloso of the harvest. In my humble opinion, this is a uh, concept that comes from the influence uh, from the surrealist movement and his point of view as an historian, as a, as a teacher himself. It's something amazing, and he developed this concept uh, of the Latin America in New York for ID. A particular phrase of the Real Maravilloso in the prologue of the first edition of the End of the World in 1949 uh, 49 in Mexico. And he says, he's a press, uh, during my stay in Haiti, at every step I found the marble real. But he also thought that the present of the vanity of the marble real was not so privileged upon Haiti, but the patrimony of Latin America. That is also important to keep in mind of the development of the group of our Haiti, but he creates this real maravilloso uh, in all the Latin America, the quality and uh, the, the fact that it uh, is very good. So. Um, the four quotes of, of, the, of this book that we are analyzing, the music in Cuba, the music in Cuba, uh, we have the four words when we say that uh, the Langaborina musical heritage with a pure legacy in popular black expression unless architectural work that another city of the Spanish colony considered super Cuba as a city, as a, uh, the place of the country, let me call it that way, with so many cities. Uh, Cuba has created music with its own characteristics which we have achieved through diffusion and influence in another culture. That's the main idea that we develop in the foreign world. There are some additions uh, where this uh, do not develop on these four words. This is just in the in the Spanish editions on the global Mexico. So it's also to keep in mind too that even before any newspaper of theater in Cuba, Father Esteban Sala was already in the cathedral of Santiago the Cuba from Bonchich, sacred music, developing church and giving music classes. Carpentier show us that in the beginnings, music in Cuba developed mainly in psychedelic music. That's a comment that I have um, in, in addition to the counseling in the class. Okay. Uh,
Okay, uh, 16 centuries. centuries. There's another uh, council that um, carpet here there to, to get information and documentation for this uh, of, uh, new. The first council of new was the military museum to the right with the conquerors, but they did not settle in Cuba. They continued with Hernan Cortez to Mexico. Some examples of these military musicians were Ortiz, the Viola player, whom Bernadier de Castillo only mentioned by the resort name. Alonso Morón, who played a vihuela, that's a kind of bigger uh, guitar. Uh, in the case of Viola, it's another kind of violin. And Porra as a singer, but we don't have so many details about Porra as a singer or person. With this musician, Cuba has experienced the first presence of music from the Iranian Peninsula, although only in the same time. That's it, uh, something interesting, uh, uh, more than interesting, important in the Carpentier contribution to this work is the documentation of the early presence of military musicians in sixteen sections of the However, in 1544, the material cure uh, Cachillo of Santiago de Cuba had the mestizo priest Miguel Velasquez in charge of the music in the cathedral. When I said the pure, the cathedral, it isn't uh, uh, a matter of the buildings or a matter of so many other things. They do have so many economic research to sustain uh, the cause and other things. It's a symbolic, it's another annotation, like an announcement that just a few decades after the arrival of the colonizer already ignored. Some of Indian mother as a Spanish father, Miguel Velasco, also a member of the first generation born in Cuba, was in charge of the music in the Santiago de Cuba Cathedral, where he also taught grammar. The fact of being a son of the governor Velasco family member, all of him who started in the Cala de Nares and Sevilla. For the part in Havana around 1605, there was a teacher named Gonzalo de Silva who had uh, back singing and organ classes. Probably the first music teacher that I had, where music was having a great presence and its economy expanded, mainly to the poor exchange. Centuries later, in the area of the port of Havana, the ring of the Chuchumbe spread which they accuse of innocent and even received sentence from the Inquisition from the headquarters in Mexico. When I turned out about the reaction with the pure of development, uh, the, there was a, a lot of change in this area that uh, potentially the development of the music as a social expression with another uh, person before and uh, even nationality was acquired to the Havana court. It's good to point out, to point out that the peace of Havana we're proposing to achieve the transfer of the Cathedral of Santiago de Cuba to, the, to Havana. One of the your arguments was the importance of music in the celebration that took place in the city, in that city, Havana, and that it should be equal to those of Mexico and Puebla. That justification was found in a document sent to the king in 1666. Triple a number of C's, by the way. <laughs> Well, well there was um, um, in Santiago, the who was in 1764. He is considered the first Cuban composer because he breaks with the Spanish format in Christmas Carol. He adopts a certain Italian influence and incorporates verse writing by himself in the Christian Carol. Carpentry musicology analysis of Salas' work in his book to build the novelty in the form of his composition, as well as his work created in various musical genres. Sala is also considered the first Cuban classical composer. His investigation at the Czech discovered original score by Stefan Sala, considered that was a good discovery for the music bibliography and documents of the first. It was for the garden eastern of the cathedral of Santiago de Cuba. Carpentier showed that the Seven Sala extended the functions of the Santiago Cathedral as a space for classical music concerts. In addition, 
but the general knows the history of the musical format and composition of Cuban popular music, coming to mark the musical periodism of Cuba. Contradance in Cuba, where the Argentine troubles, the French contradicts uh, dancing in Haiti and right in Cuba, with uh, the immigrants from the Haitian Revolution and the slave they broke. The Contradanza quickly evolved into the Cuban Contradanza, from which arose the genres of dances, the Habanera and the Guajira. Certain Chavani torrents in the society of the time attacked the, uh, the Contradanza as a contrary to Christianity and diabolical invasions introduced by friends. But popular taste and power was about this attack. His musical influence was certain root in Cuban popular music and society in general, even coming to create a contradance title in the mother is Conga, dancer in honor to the Capitan General Concha. As a great contradiction to but the official uh, level of the government, and about the seven for the, the, the people keeping the, the interactions of the society with this. Uh, um, Kind of music, contradanza that even with a sign, they dedicated one contradanza with that name, the mother is conga, uh, to the capital general concha. That's the power of the, of the popular force in any cultural section. The music also plays. Um, another of the outlook uh, contribution was to play how the songs. Dances and music of the slave were incorporated into the pop of popular music. Uh, not only because of their own charm, but because of the uh, few social options that the slaves had, and also the freedom. In addition to offering them a sense of their identity taken from Africa and putting picaresca to their interaction with white, free, or mulatto people, more and more accepting the musical instruments to the, uh, of the different African nations. Without black music, there is no Cuban music, absolutely, there are no rules. The so-called great dancers were also American, were white, mulatto, and even Spaniards. Hey, Pedro. Hey? Pedro, instead yeah. of reading the rest of it, just tell us what you thought of the book. Okay, okay. Just, so, uh, that was uh, the, uh, that's another uh, comment that I have, not just uh, the cost uh, that I have uh, written. What did you get out of the book? Well, uh, the book is a uh, uh, novelty in the Cuban biography. Why? Because he calls type both, uh, both concepts, the, the popular music and the, the Cuban classical music with the same link. There are something that before this book, it wasn't completed in the uh, Cuban biographies about the Cuban music on presentations in the Caribbean and Latin American uh, uh, musicology uh, research. That's in my humble opinion, <laughs> say that way. Uh, what is the first value, the first value, the main value of the book is to uh, call an attention about the, the root of the, of the of the classical uh, music, even the sacred music, and the stage of the uh, century train. Um, that is also down, in my opinion, right to the, to the, uh, the eyes. There are another another book with this topic, but anyone heard to the, um, to the carpenter uh, development. There are also ETP, which was the book of the research uh, development for because the Mexicans were the Mexican institution to carry him with that uh, with that topic. But he assumed that uh, he was deep uh, um, in so many uh, sources, for example. Uh, the Esteban Salas uh, approach and another music that he found that was a novelty, that was an idea about the oral tradition, but nobody could find any document about it. And he found in the San, uh, Cathedral of Santiago in forgotten uh, clothes, as he said, uh, that's unbelievable. 
Uh, we face another um, problem because there is someone with another kind of biography for Kate to you know, let him to access to, to, to the, the, the document. And did anyone else read the book? I read it. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was pretty amazing how he combined the, uh, the European classical music, uh, with, uh, Afro Cuban music in one book. It, it, I thought it was a very good book. Any questions for Pedro? Oh, let me call an attention for just one of the Cuban author, the mulatto Jose White, who went to, uh, even he took class on the Paris Conservatory, but he keeps him in that uh, popular group in his classics of uh, um, uh, music uh, uh, pieces in Europe. Uh, there is something that Captain Kerry called an attention. They try to keep it classic, but at the same time, they preserve the popular group in their creation. Okay, very good job. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to present, uh, informally present your research before we go? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go, Tony. Okay. Uh, I, need, I need to be co-host, so I'm not co-host. Hold on a second. Okay, you. Uh, let me go here. Let's see. Walter Moore, co-host. Yes. Okay, then, then I will stop to share the screen. Hello? Yes, can you can you stop sharing, please? Why? Let me have a control. Have no, that's it. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. So let me move for another screen now. Hello, George. Thank you. So, Walter, Walter, didn't you already share this? Oh, huh? yes. I thought you already shared this. No, no, no this is uh, uh, this, this is a uh, this is a final work presentation, a final research. Okay, all right. We have to present. Uh huh. I present the last time I present was a book called uh, Oh, Jews. that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the making of okay. the law. Okay, I remember is, uh, now. Uh huh. This is the final work that. Well, I am correcting my. My paperwork <laughs> because I'm finished, but I have to correct it because you know I have some some grammar issues. But okay, this is uh this is my work. It's called How the Book of Shark Accounts the Descriptive Language Changes the Understanding of the Natural Law of the 16th Century. So we want to start explaining and use it um, the example for two important authors in international law. So these two are William Rubio and Matikos Kinemi. These two authors change the perception and the conception uh, or how we can make history of international law why because in the traditional books of international law we always we can see that the tradition uh, the international law it's about evolution it's con it's related to the evolution so <clears throat> they call it, they started to talk about eugentium then medieval age uh, then the international law evolved in the in the medieval age and then evolved 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 it's not these two authors change the conception and talk about epochs epochs of international law why because the international law is related to the empire so that's the reason why when you have an international law a global inter, a global law you have the a big empire to create the law so this idea it's not a migration it's created by an australian professor who is now uh, in Egypt, in the American Egyptian uh, University School, uh, his name is Thomas Scoutry. He changed the conception of the, how to make history of international law. He, he criticized the classic methodology of how to make uh, international legal history because all the, the majority of books on international law have this methodology. All wants to search the truth. All they they understand that using the historical knowledge it's different for writing history because they try to connect the historical knowledge to the context and they think that international lawyers think that the context 
it uh, determines how the outdoors white uh, text. And you know, he, and the final issue is that all the international lawyers follow uh, the, the international law like an evolutionary path. And that's not true. My methodology and uh, their methodology is this. International legal history is a discourse because we interpret text. We read text and we have the comprehension to understand why these authors try to save us in these years. But in that years has different um, have different interpretations of that. So the, the, the way to understand these texts or manuals to, of international law are different from epochs. That's the reason why they divide for epochs. They divide the international law by epochs. That's very interesting. Second, the context is under to mind because all the, all the authors of international law have to need to have a reference for. For example, Hugo Grotius has a reference uh, Francisco de Vitoria. Or Francisco de Vitoria has reference about Gaius. Gaius has reference about Cicerón. So all are connected. It's not about, hey, I have this problem, I want to worry about it. This is my creation. The, the creation is not alone. You have a before. So for that reason, uh, we conclude that humanity doesn't follow an evolutionary path. You have different conceptions of the international law in different epochs. So I want to explain how in the medieval ages uh, the, the international law are comprehended and then I want to explain the, uh, the change. First, you have a very important